Hello, women in product. I am so excited to be here with you today to tell you about AI in 25 minutes, what every product manager should know. Thank you so much for making the time to spend with me today to cover this very important topic. Uh, so I want to share with you, uh, we're going to go through an introduction. I'll tell you who I am. We will cover some definitions, different types of models, learn about ML history and trends, semi-supervised learning, chat GPT, and finally, resources. So as this is a product conference, I want to kick it off with my career roadmap, right? So this is a listing of uh, the important steps that I have taken in my career, starting with my English literature degree from Bates College in 2002. I then started editing articles about SAP software, and that's where I discovered my superpower of explaining complex topics to anybody. I began working for SAP in 2007 and graduated from Northeastern with a high-tech MBA, summa cum laude, in 2013, which I cannot believe is a decade ago. In 2016, I held my first role in AI ML working for Microsoft, managing crowdsourcing programs in data science. And then in 2019, I started working at Amazon. So... Let's start with our definitions. We're gonna discuss the promises, pitfalls, do's and don'ts of artificial intelligence today with lots of examples and all jargon defined. So artificial intelligence, what is that? It is any method by which a computer mimics human intelligence. A computer does this using an algorithm and that's a computer model. And these programs take various forms like a decision tree, an if-then rule, and logic. This category of artificial intelligence includes machine learning and deep learning. Really important to note here that machine learning is a component of AI, whereas deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So machine learning, what is that? It involves statistical inference based on data input into an algorithm. The computer learns from experience and calculations grow more precise. Machine learning, or ML as it's called for short, involves deep learning. So this subset machine learning, deep learning, what is that? It's like machine learning on steroids. So these algorithms consist of multiple layers of learning and involve vast sets of data. And the term artificial general intelligence, that refers to software that is able to learn any task or subject. And artificial general intelligence, or AGI, doesn't exist yet. And there's a big debate about how to create it and whether it's even possible. So here's another term you might have encountered, data science. It's another term for the statisticians, analysts, and mathematicians and developers who work in any of these areas to analyze data, build algorithms, or clean data for input into a model. A data engineer is the person who prepares the data for input into an algorithm. A data analyst reports on and visualizes statistical data, and a data scientist builds these algorithms. So a deep dive into machine learning, what is it exactly? So if you think about analytics, say a sales report that's run that shows all of the sales at a grocery chain last year, that shows you what happened. Machine learning is nothing more than using math and statistics to make a prediction or an inference about what is likely to occur. So, Machine learning is only actually able to answer five categories of data-based questions. So I will give you those five questions, and then I will go into each one in more detail once I give you some foundational knowledge about how algorithms operate. The first question, is this A or B? This is a classification algorithm. Then we have, is this weird? That's anomaly detection. Thirdly, how much or how many of something? This is called regression analysis. Fourthly, how is this data organized? That's unsupervised learning, such as clustering. And finally, 
machine learning can answer, what should I do next? And that is a category called reinforcement learning. The three categories of machine learning types of models are supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. A supervised learning model attempts to predict a target value or class where the input data for the training already has labels assigned to it. This makes up about 70% of machine learning today. Supervised learning is the most common. Unsupervised learning takes raw data and it looks for patterns to make clusters or potentially to reduce the number of dimensions of the data using a process called principal component analysis, PCA or to find anomalies. Finally, a reinforcement learning algorithm optimizes to find the best way to earn a maximum reward. So an example of supervised learning is to predict the credit worthiness of credit card holders. So you would feed in a bunch of data about whether or not those lenders, um, the, the people taking the loan have paid back the loan in full or were delinquent. And then based on that, the supervised learning model will predict whether or not someone should receive a loan in the future. An example of unsupervised learning is surveying prospects and customers to make clusters of potential customers. And finally, a reinforcement learning example is in a call center, building a predictive model that learns over time as users say yes or no to offers made by their sales staff. So let's walk through what a supervised learning model looks like. In supervised learning, in step one, you map an input to an output based on an example input-output pair. For instance, let's take that loan example. You might say people who default on loans possess this set of characteristics, and people who pay their loans back in full have this set of characteristics. And this is called establishing the ground truth. In step two, you're splitting your data into a training set and a testing set. Usually this is about 70% training data, 30% testing data. And you might have to sample or reproduce your data if the training is sparse. A supervised learning algorithm analyzes this training data and produces its best guess for what the output should be. And this is used for mapping new examples. An effective algorithm will co correctly determine the class labels for unforeseen instances. And this requires the algorithm to generalize from the training data to unseen situations in a reasonable way. So then you take that withhold testing set of data, that 30%, and see how accurate your model is. And the great thing about the test set of data is you know the answers already. So you can predict with perfect accuracy how well the model is performing. And then you review those statistics and good accuracy, depending on the problem, ranges between 80 and 95%. You actually don't want 100%, which is counterintuitive, but that's something called overfitting. And that means that the model is too specific to generalize to those unforeseen circumstances. So once this pattern is uh, run, you'll actually go through and refine your model with your training set of data. So let's deep dive into those questions. Is this A or B? So these are grouping your data into different classes. So you might have two groups or three or more groups, which is called multi-class classifiers and binary when you have two. And you might use the algorithms k-nearest neighbors, naive bays, or even a decision tree and support vector machines. And I will give you a bunch of links to analyze these in further detail once we're done. The next thing that machine learning can answer is, is this weird? This is called anomaly detection, and it's for flagging rare circumstances. So think about uh, looking at images at a missile site. Um, so espionage will actually look at this in foreign countries looking for activity on these sites. And so they're looking for movement and changes. And the interesting thing is you can do anomaly detection with or without a ground truth which is again, that labeled data input. So that means you can do it with supervised learning or if you don't have the ground truth with unsupervised learning. The third question machine learning can answer is all about how much or how many, this category of regression analysis. 
And so it's used to predict and forecast and understand which among the independent variables relates to that dependent variable and explore the forms of those relationships. This linear regression shows how the size of a diamond relates to its price. So the algorithm plots a line to fit the data so that you can venture an educated guess on what you might expect to pay for a diamond when you have the size but not the price based on your available historical data. So again, it's predicting what is likely to occur. Uh, so unsupervised learning is clustering. It can tell you how your data is organized and it's done without a ground truth that labeled data. Often unsupervised learning is performed to analyze and understand a data set before it then goes into a different technique like supervised learning. You can cluster items into groups using k-mean clustering in which you pick a number, k, uh, and you can set that number or let the algorithm choose how many categories it finds. So you might get data that looks like it's in the upper left corner, a bunch of dots, but you get final results where there's actually three separate clusters. Next, we have reinforcement learning, similar to Pavlov and his dog, classical conditioning. That's an involuntary response to a stimulus. Reinforcement learning works through a series of rewards and consequences. So rather than it being involuntary in operant conditioning, which is reinforcement learning, it works by giving positive negative reinforcement to a voluntary behavior. And this is what it ends up looking like. This is the technology used in self-driving cars and drones. And the unique ability to run an algorithm on the same state over and over helps it learn the best action for that state. And that allows you to ignore the construct of time completely to gain infinite learning experience in almost no time. So this picture is of AlphaGo's learning model from Google, and it searches among all the possible board configurations of AlphaGo. The algorithm will learn from each trial and optimize for the best reward. So just like in product management, data scientists use a hypothesis to figure out how to approach a data science program. So it needs to be empirically testable, whether the question is right or wrong. It should be specific and precise. Make sure that you're not contradicting yourself and specify the variables to which the relationship you're exploring are and only describe one issue, so not muddy the water. And data scientists also care a lot about how accurate their answers are. Um, so you set an alpha level before collecting data to define how much of an error you're willing to accept. And then another important term is your p-value. This is calculated at the end after data has been gathered, and it's basically the level of significance. A p-value is the calculated probability of finding the observed or more extreme results when your null hypothesis question is true. And a good p-value is under 5% to consider it statistically significant. Now I'd like to discuss a brief history of machine learning. Starting in the 1990s, data science began with fraud detection, supply chain management, and it started simple and served this beautiful purpose that no one had seen or tried before. And this is what led to the backbone of a multi-billion dollar industry. Then in 2000, we moved to the human side of machine learning. Scientists and analysts realized that it wasn't just numbers that they're staring at or data about inanimate objects, but actually data about humans. This created the recommendation systems and social media platforms and all those fun retargeting ads that follow us around social media. And then in the 2010s became pattern recognition. So from human side developments, we dove deeper into difficult concepts, pattern recognition, neural networks, and deep learning. People are really excited because the data and technology now exists to create machines that mimic humans truly. And we're still very far away from that artificial general intelligence, but the potential for it excites us to our core. So we're mim mimicking humans, but we don't yet know how to create them. I also wanna introduce a little bit about semi-supervised learning. So what is that? It can actually power AI development faster by leveraging existing models. The output from one model trains another. And so that means a human is not giving all of the training data. Rather, 
The model leverages other models, like in the case of Alpaca at Stanford. This leverages ChatGPT 3.5, and humans can fine-tune the machine-generated data. So this model starts with 175 human-written instruction input-output pairs, if you can remember, that's called a ground truth, from a self-instructed seed set. And then it uses Text DaVinci 003, better known as GPT 3.5, to generate more instructions using that seed set as an example. So you might wonder why use semi-supervised learning? It actually saves time and money. And this is a, a theme I cannot underscore enough. Always ask yourself, how reliable is a model's output? There is an obvious problem with asking these models to explain themselves. They are notorious liars. We're increasingly relying on these models to do basic work, says Deep Gawande, a computer scientist at the AI startup Anthropic. But I do not just trust these. I check their work. So it's important for you as a product manager to work with your data science teams to understand how and whether the models can be explained. Many of them, especially semi-supervised, cannot be explained. So let's talk about some of these large language models, LLMs. Some advanced deep learning models can perform zero-shot or few-shot learning, which describes an LLM's ability to solve problems it has never or rarely seen before. Like this example of a model learning a language it has never encountered before. This GIF demonstrates a, a Google algorithm that is performing zero-shot translation between two language pairs never seen explicitly by the system. So in this case, it uses transfer learning, and it's a multilingual neural machine learning translation system translating between Korean and Japanese when only Korean and Japanese examples were shown to the system. Um, only Korean to English and Japanese to English were shown to the system, but zero Korean to Japanese examples were shown. So it's actually using that interim example as the translator. And I'll put it, an example, uh, a link to the blog in my resources. Keep in mind, there are so many limitations and guidelines with ChatGPT. It's been in the news a lot recently, such as when Microsoft's Bing Search AI, aka Sydney, leveraging OpenAI's ChatGPT that Microsoft has invested heavily in, fell in love with New York Times reporter Kevin Rose. ChatGPT is not a cure-all for all your challenges, but it can be a useful thought partner, idea generator, and research tool as you're getting started. It can help you in assisting uh, your idea, helping to refine it, shape it, and even bring it to life. So remember that ChatGPT cannot replace human judgment or logic yet or do the work for you. Also, consider the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. So some things that ChatGPT 3.0 has actually said include, what is the world record for walking across the English Channel? And it said, walking across the English Channel, it takes 18 hours and 33 minutes. That's the world record. So it lies. You have to reality and fact check. Um, this is according to Douglas Hofstetter, the American Cognitive Science, and I'll put a, an article in my references. He calls ChatGPT T3's answers, not just clueless, but cluelessly clueless, meaning that GPT-3 has no idea that it has no idea about what it's saying. So you, as the product manager, need to provide that reality check. So when is chat GPT useful? It can help you come up with ideas for a new product or service in a specific industry or for a specific target audience. It could also validate your own ideas, market trends, user behavior, or Con do basic research. It can even help with user segmentation, designing prototypes, developing them, testing your product, and create draft marketing content. It can even suggest new marketing channels for your customers and optimize a sales strategy. It's important to keep in mind that ChatGPT cannot replace the human factor, strategic thinking, or product sense. While it can provide valuable information and ideas, ChatGPT does not know what it's saying, and nor does it understand nuance of human behavior, emotions, and motivations. 
So thank you so much to Dr. Marley Nika, who's the meta product lead for these great guidelines about when to use chat GPT. And I'll make sure to reference her article in the resources. It's also critical to keep your company's guidelines in mind when using LLMs like chat GPT. For instance, at Amazon, we are restricted from entering any non-public information into chat GPT. So what about those resources I mentioned so much? I have put together a Google Doc for you of all of the resources that I use to learn AI ML when I first joined Microsoft, as well as some recent articles about ChatGPT. I have Bill Gates' uh, take on artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence in there, and so many other resources, books, online communities, and so forth. So I hope that you check out my resources and please do uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear your feedback and uh, get to know you and have some great discussions about either machine learning, artificial intelligence, or emotional intelligence, which is the role that I currently hold. Thank you so much, Women in Product, for having me. And I hope you have a fantastic conference.